I'm Hewins. And I'm Sun. And today we're on the red carpet to tell you about plotting and storylines in your screenplay. It's a big word, plot, to plot or not to plot, to write your storyline. These big words and you can look it all up and people have different definitions, but to actually put uh, words down on a screenplay that's at least 90 pages long, how do you achieve that? What actually makes up all of that? We know you have dialogue, we know you have action lines, but what actually makes up all that? What's the big grand plot storyline that you strings all this together? Are, are we going to sit down? I mean, this is a podcast, right? Look, have you ever seen a podcast where somebody stands up the whole time? I mean, no, I this haven't. This is groundbreaking. You got to start new marketing ideas if we're going to get anything going. But I mean, they might not accept it on on the podcast thing if if we're standing. Who watches a podcast? Do people stare at like Joe Rogan the whole time? Do they stare at his face <laughs> closer? I don't know. I want to see his face closer. I don't know. So yeah. we're actually doing you a favor by putting us a little bit, you know, at arms. It's like distance. we're stand up comedians. Yeah, well, we'll we'll need to work on our comedy writing before we yeah. <laughs> market ourselves as or, that or stand-ins in a, in a movie you know stand-ins. what I mean? yeah right i'm sure everybody who clicked on this video you, you got to stand up that. for something right right well if you're watching this video you're interested in screenwriting you don't care at all about being a stand-in on a movie set you might have to to make some money in the meantime uh but today we got some brilliant questions in from a screenwriter at the john 316 film school down in uganda uh, and Caroline, shout out to Caroline for these awesome questions about plotting. If you have any questions uh, for beginner screenwriters, please send them in the comments and let us know. We'll, we'll talk about them. Exactly. Um, so so what's, what's the first question? What are the rules that govern writing a story? Well, you know, this was something that you and I really um, took to heart and and. and dove into to try to figure this out when we said, hey, we're gonna we're gonna give a go of this movie making thing and screenwriting. So I wanted to start with the basic, which is is the story. And and you hear so much uh, about stories these days, storytellers. I mean it's it has permeated the corporate world. People are like, you gotta be a storyteller, you know, to sell something, you gotta be a storyteller. So, you know, you definitely have to tell a story. If the guy right. shows up to your house to spray for bugs and says, oh, I'm a certified storyteller. That's I've got to right. sur- uh, storytell killing That's these right. cockroaches. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's the story. There's, you know, there's a giant roach under your bed and I'm here to <laughs> slay the dragon, right? But uh, before we get there, there's the dark night of the soul where, right. you know, where all the roaches come out after, you know, and you think... There's no way to, that the heroes can right. make it in the end, but yeah. so like everybody's got it in their LinkedIn bio now. I'm this, uh, you know. I, yes. I spray for bugs, but I'm also a storyteller. That's right. I, you know, I, exterminator I, I, slash storyteller. <laughs> right. Gardener, storyteller, road paper. Exactly. So what are, what are the elements of a story? Well, it's a very basic element of, of a story is is the beginning, the middle, and the end, right? So you've got to. That's have, what Aristotle said. That's right. right. Uh, you've got to you got to start somewhere. Uh, you got to have something happen in the middle, and then you got to end up somewhere. Right. So if you're writing a screenplay, those are some of the things you need to think about before you really get into it. What what is going to be the ending for this character that I'm developing? This plot that's going on. It's got to start somewhere, and it's got to end somewhere. So I like to I like to start with the end in mind. Okay. I know I know where I'm going. Uh, then I can make that map. If you set out on vacation and you don't know where you're going, it could be an adventure, great, but it could just meander and go on forever and ever. Right. So let's roll a quick clip that will help you understand an example we're going to talk about. Uh, this is a clip from the screenplay that you wrote that's won over 40 awards, Made with Love. It's what we're on the red carpet of right now here in our living room. <laughs> Celebrating before, that's because it's not made yet, because we need your help. Um, we're actually crowdfunding. We've raised over $200,000 for this movie, so you know the story is strong. Uh, Brent McCorkle, co-director and composer of The Jesus Revolution, which just came out, and, or sorry, it's just a Jesus Revolution. That's I'm right. not going to put a the on there, just like this is made with love. It's not the made with love, okay? So we got to get the titles right. But that movie made $50 million in the box office, and Brent is so hyped up about the story. So you know the story is certified fresh, and uh, we're about to play the little animatic, a synopsis uh, of this story so you can know. Roll the clip. When Bert Morrow lost his wife and baby during childbirth, his dreams of a life filled with joy burned out. 
Over his lifetime, he's clung to one last ember of hope, opening his own cafe and losing himself in his love for the culinary arts. Now that the arduous days of teaching are behind him, he can finally begin to work on his lifelong dream. Then, fate steps in when Jay, his neighbor with Down syndrome, knocks at his door looking for a friend. Jay invites himself in for a meal, and Bert reluctantly complies, but gets more than he bargained for when Jay begins to visit daily. Between cooking with Jay and keeping an eye on him while waiting for his mother to get home from work, Bert tries to perfect his recipes while preparing to open the cafe. The more time Bert spends with Jay, the more Jay's love begins to melt his heart. But just when Bert thinks he has a handle on his new situation, Jay's mother, Wendy, is arrested. Bert takes Jay in temporarily and struggles to keep the plans for his restaurant moving forward. Frustrated by all the interruptions, Bert finally gets his peace and quiet after Wendy is released and returns to take Jay. However, Jay's absence has the opposite effect than expected. Bert's world seems suddenly dim and colorless. When Bert discovers that Jay has an abusive home life, he does something unexpected. He puts his own plans on the back burner and decides to put up the money he saved for the cafe to hire a lawyer to fight for Jay's custody. Bert feels something stirring within him that he hasn't felt in years. Empathy, hope, and love. But despite his best efforts, the court rules that Jay will remain in a county facility. Bert's heartbroken, and he loses the lease on his restaurant. But just as Bert's world comes crashing down around him, the community rallies together to raise the money to save his cafe. With renewed purpose, Bert opens his cafe and his heart, employing individuals with different abilities. But he can't deny that a part of him feels like it's missing without Jay there. One day, Wendy walks in, looking professional and put together. Bert assumes she's looking for a job and tells her that he only hires individuals with different abilities. She assures him that she has a good job, but she wants Bert to know that she's changed and she's a good person. She confides in him that she had been given a choice to terminate her pregnancy, yet she still deliberately chose to keep Jay. She gestures for someone to come out from around the corner. It's Jay! Bert's world is finally bright again. It's a happy reunion for everyone. All right, boom, so that's what the story of Made With Love looks like in an overview. Now that we've shown you that, uh, I figure, you know, that will help us tell you, like, th there's the external plot of that, and then there's sort of this internal journey that the main character, Mr. Morrow, goes on, that the plot moves forward as he changes, right? Right. So you could say, well, you know, you started with the end in mind. You knew that he had this goal to get a cafe, and you wanted by the end for him to get a cafe, Uh but the story that we just showed you would have been so hollow and lifeless if it was literally just a man who, I want a cafe, okay, I try to get a cafe, I get the cafe, the end. Right. You yeah. you had a, a lesson that you wanted him to learn. Absolutely. To go on there. And I knew I wanted to make a drama. Uh, that's another thing. When you're starting out writing something, a story, you need to decide kind of what the genre is. And, you know, will you be making a a horror film or a comedy or a drama or a thriller or action film. So I knew that there needed to be some drama in there and uh, we couldn't just give him the prize at the end. We had to have him fight for it. And, and that's what pulls your audience in. If you have a main character that the audience can empathize with and they want to pull for and they want that character to win and get over those hurdles, those obstacles that stand in his way, uh, then you know, you're know you going to bring the audience along on the ride with you. Right. So. To recap on that first question, rules for a story. Really, there is no universal formula to stories. Really, what matters is what are your favorite stories. Find out what your favorite stories are, and that is where you there, there's tropes, you could say, in different types of stories. In a romance, there's sort of rules to writing a rom-com. There's rules to writing what would happen in a drama. Um, there's, yeah, you've probably heard that with the rom-com. Boy meets girl. Boy loses girl, boy fights to get girl again, you know, right. whatever. So find out what your favorite movies are. We've studied what our favorite movies are, and that has, has been what's informed the general rules that you follow. But uh, overall, there is not one formula other than three acts or beginning, middle, and end that you can overlay on every story. So don't worry too much about that yeah. there's some universal rule and just figure out what kind of stories do I like to tell. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, 
what mostly does one need to write a screenplay? And, and she specified here, like, what do you need to get started writing a screenplay? Uh, and then from there, what are the main things that actually make up a screenplay? Well, uh, yeah, so I mean, that's a good question. I'll go back to something like the genre. I mean, decide on what type of screenplay that you want to write. If you really love rom-coms, then don't go try to write a thriller or, you know, a horror movie. Uh, but if you love those, then, you know, look at the elements that you think make up a really good horror movie. I mean, that was one thing that I... I, I you know, enjoyed about how you and I studied was we read all the books on screenplay, and they're not that many that are really good. Read them all, understand the principles, then go and watch some of your favorite movies or some of, you know, get a list of the top, you know, 100 best films or the Oscar winners. Watch them and, and try to see how they used these rules or principles uh, from the books, and, and then you can have some tools to use when you start writing. But genre is one thing. You can decide if you want to have what type of protagonist you want, who you want your hero to be in the film. Uh, is it an ensemble cast? Uh, you, then you start looking at things like locations. And all these things are developed when you think about what's going to be best for telling your story, what's going to be best for um, uh, an environment that will showcase the, the protagonist. Uh, you know, if it's a horror movie, you know, it's probably not going to take place outside in the middle of the day in a, in a beautiful park. I mean, it could, uh, but you know, it's, it's better to have something in a, you know, a dark castle or whatever. Um, so think about the setting and think about the theme. Think about time period. Does it, does it have to be present day or you know, is, it, is it something from the past? Is it a period piece? So these are some of the elements that you want to start to discover for your screenplay. So yeah, so all those things that you just talked about are sort of like external things, external factors right. that like helped you with building all your ideas for the screenplays you've written. So yeah. with this screenplay, Made With Love, you know, you thought, okay, I want this, uh, it takes place around this old, jaded, retiring home ec school teacher uh, inspired by a, a teacher you actually had growing up. Yeah, so I mean, I actually thought about the character first and and that is, that's good too. I mean, there's no you know, no one way to do it. So I thought about the character and, and said, okay, I want him to be, actually at first, when I first started thinking about the story, I thought about him being a, a writing teacher and he loved literature and he just wanted to retire and read books. But I changed it to a home ec teacher. Right. Uh, and then <clears throat> once I changed it to a home ec teacher, for one, I knew I wanted him to live this austere lifestyle that showed that he didn't have a lot of money. So he lives in a, just this one bedroom, you know, dingy apartment that he's had for many years. Uh, so that helps to build the character of who this gentleman is. Uh, then, uh, you know, being a home ec teacher, then I knew that would give me what his goal was. He wants to open a cafe. That's his dream. He's going to retire from being a home ec teacher, which at one time might have been fulfilling, but then after 40 years, it right. wasn't fulfilling anymore. Nobody respected him. And then he wanted to open this cafe. So these things started defining what, you know, the elements that were in the story. So all of that external stuff then led you to find the internal, which I think this is really what's going to answer your question. What makes up a screenplay? All that you just said is what helps you to get started. It's like, all right, what if I have this guy in this environment in this story? You know, for me, a lot of my uh, stories that I've written are based off of like a quirky neighbor that we have or, uh, you know, a family a quirky member. quirky cousin. Yeah, quirky. <laughs> my dad's cousin who is uh, a fossil hunter living in Alabama, modern day Alabama, finding prehistoric fossils and thinking, okay, this is this cool thing. I want to write about it. So I think that's where it starts is get fascinated, get curious about something. And that's where you start. But what actually makes up all those 90 pages? Because that's a lot. You know, how do you get into that? You need to find the internal conflict. You need to find a flawed character that you can create a character arc for, from. Yeah. Um, and that's what is in some of the best stories of all time. Think about the Pixar movies that are so widely known. Toy Story, which has, you know, there's been four other movies based off of that one franchise. Think about um, Finding Nemo. These are stories that have very clearly defined character flaws for the main characters. Marlin in Finding Nemo is 
very like from the very start painted as this helicopter parent but we know why he's like that who's afraid of life who's afraid of his own shadow right you know and afraid of the big abyss out there and guess what happens his son who he loves very much is taken away and now he has to go out into the the great blue yonder right and andrew stanton the writer of that screenplay what inspired the idea for that whole movie was a bath towel that was uh, his son's, uh, you know, that he would see during bath time at the end of each day coming home. And it was uh, the clownfish on mm-hmm. there. And so he would see that and he thought, you know, well, what, what about a story about these guys? It would be cool. Uh, and from there, he found that as a parent, he could relate to Marlon and thinking, oh, I could see how I could be like this guy. The world's a scary place. I could see possibly being too overprotective and how that could actually hurt the growth of my son yeah. and then help it. So first you find that cool, you see the bath towel, you go, okay, that would be a cool idea. But then you, you try to relate and you connect and you try to find some sort of relatable flaw that this character could have. So think about that in Nemo. In the first five minutes, they, they set this up. You see the tragedy that happens to Marlon. He loses his wife. He thinks they found a good neighborhood, but he loses her to this barracuda uh, that kills her. And uh, it's this tragedy that now you understand, okay, I can see why he would be an overprotective parent after that. So just once again, the question is, what builds a whole 90-page screenplay or more? You get that in that first five pages, you've set up, wow, he is you know, scared of the whole big wide ocean. But now the one thing that he was protecting most is set on the other side of the ocean. Boom, that's your adventure. And now you have all these scenes that you could come up with of okay what are the different things that he's going to encounter trying to get to nemo and it's meaningful because he's scared about it and he's going to have to slowly change and as he meets dory this super spontaneous character who is not afraid of anything mainly due to her short-term memory loss she you know she is not afraid of going into an abyss or you know hanging out with sharks or whatever so that's what actually makes up the thing is you you set up right off the bat this juicy internal conflict, and that just leads to this really uh, excite these exciting scenes. You just you get into it. You know what I mean? Like that's what you had with with Mister Morrow. Is yes, he wants to open a cafe, but also he's got this whole thing where he just wants it to be to himself. You set up right off the bat that there's these students, his colleagues, and he's really disconnected from all of them. He's not really a people person. He wants to be by himself. But guess what? Jay knocks on his door. Kind of like, you know, in Nemo, you've got uh, Marlon has to learn from Dory. She comes into his life and changes him, Mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, that's just what I would think if you you want to get into it. You want that juicy internal layer that fuels you to come up with these external things. Juicy internal layer. I'm like thinking about a juicy burger or something about right now. Okay, well... You got to keep standing yeah, for another just, question. Not time for eating yet. No, can I <laughs> no. come on. Okay. Endurance. Okay. Uh, now, here, the next question is, how do we best include plot points? And this is the last question here. Um, first of all, I would say don't worry about including plot points too much. Um, right? I mean, I would because some people say you've got to hit it at these... Well, I mean, I think there need to be plot points, but I think some people can get very rigid about what page that plot point has to be on. Uh, you know, and an inciting incident is another thing that has, you know, they, in some of these books, it's like, oh, it has to happen by page so-and-so. But what, what you think of is you have an hour and a half to two hour long movie, and, it, and they're here, people are sitting in these very comfortable seats in the dark. You don't want them to go to sleep. So these plot points and, you know, inciting incident, these things are devices to get that story moving, to keep it exciting, to have the audience get involved. Inciting incident, you introduce this character, then something happens and it pulls the audience along. It sets that character in motion to go do something, to change directions, you know, to head off on the adventure or whatever it is. First plot point that's around page 30, uh, you know, 30 minutes into the movie, let's keep the audience in it. All of a sudden, turn the action in another direction and it catches the audience off guard or whatever and makes them wake up and go, oh, wait a minute, the guy's going somewhere else. I didn't expect that. Uh, so there are devices that are used to just keep the audience interested. Right. So me personally, I mean, I bet if I looked at my scripts, they would probably be pretty close to those marks. But I don't necessarily think about that, especially on a first draft. I'm just trying to write it 
um, and take that character from one point to another and make sure there are arcs happening. And then I'll go back and look and go, all right, it gets a little sleepy here around 30 minutes. So maybe I should do something else to get, you know, get the audience back awake. So that's, that's the way I look at plot. Right. Yeah. For me, I'll give an example uh, right now from Linda Seeger, uh, making a good script. Great. A book that we love a lot. And she broke down plots in a way, uh, just the actual, the beats of it in a way that is very simple, but made sense to me. Uh, using an example of Back to the Future, uh, it's five points. It starts with setup. That's uh, Marty meets Doc Brown at the mall for a science experiment test. Uh, plot point one is the uh, Marty gets into the time machine and accidentally goes back in time. Uh, and then the development is Marty tries to figure out how to get back to the future. He's got to locate Doc because uh, he first teleports in and he's in the middle of this barn. So he's got to use a phone book and find Doc. And along the way, he's running into his parents. And uh, finally, he meets Doc. And now they're trying to figure out how to do this. Then the second turning point is they f figure out the master plan of how they're going to get Marty back to the future. But it's this like really of the essence sort of moment that they, they've got to capture lightning in a bottle. They've got to have lightning strike the top of this building. Uh, and Marty has to be driving the car in the exact place, the exact right time. And it's something that could very much go wrong. Everything has to fall into place for it to happen. Then the resolution, they make it happen. They pull it off the, you know, they survive the worst of it. And Marty is back to the future. Yeah. So that is a way of looking at it in the external. You could uh, you know, apply that to made with love and go, all right, well, Mr. Morrow, you set up, he's this jaded home act teacher. It's his last day of school. He's retiring and uh, he wants to open a cafe. That's his dream. And, uh, you know, finally he, he retires. He, he starts cleaning up his storefront and, uh, but Jay comes in. That's the inciting incident. You know, that's the first plot point. Now he's got to balance the time with Jay because Jay's mother, Wendy, is getting arrested, and he's got to balance the time with Jay and still working to open his cafe, you know. And then, of course, uh, Jay is going to be going off to an institution where he's going to be in the custody of, uh, of his, the county. Of the county. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Morrow has bonded with him so much he doesn't want to see Jay go, but he still wants the cafe, but he's got to put up his money for the cafe to adopt Jay. Um, and he fights for Jay. And that's sort of like this, the second plot point moment is building to that. Then the resolution, the community comes together to uh, pitch in to get the cafe since Mr. Morrow had spent it all trying to fight for Jay in court. And Jay's mom is um, got her act together and they all reunite in yep. the cafe. Yep. So... So yeah, so that Linda Seeger book is great as far as plot points. And I would just say find some really good movies. You know, your favorite movies, yes, but movies that probably rate at the top so we know that they're really well written. Watch them and try to look for those plot points and figure out why they put them there, for what reason, and you should have some good answers to those questions. That's right. Well, uh, if you want to see Made with Love actually be a movie so we don't have to show you storyboards and my voiceover narration of it to convey the story and you think this will actually move people or you just want to see this as an entertaining piece of cinema, please go to madewithlovethemovie.com and uh, support us and Jay's dream uh, of making this beautiful film. Uh, it's really going to impact the world in a positive way. Yeah. Um, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Standing Podcast, uh, where we talk about character and developing a character. How do you make a believable character? So see yeah. you then. And uh, all right, smile for the camera. <laughs>